You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, Episode 21. This episode, I'm speaking with the creative director of Humblebee Films, Stephen Dunleavy. Stephen started his career looking to become a sound recordist on natural history films, but instead became a researcher on an IMAX production for 18 months. He later transitioned to working for the BBC as a researcher, producer and director. Then in 2009, Stephen set up Humblebee Films with an express aim of producing standout factual television focusing on nature, science and history. Humblebee Films has an impressive roster of films, including Attenborough and the Giant Elephant, David Attenborough's Natural Curiosities, Amazing Pigs, Tasmania Weird and Wonderful, Planet Parrot, The Real Dingo, Walrus Tutan Tusker, and Komodo the Dragon's Bite. Stephen, thanks so much for taking your time out of your afternoon here at the Jackson Hole Wildlife Film Festival. Let's start off with how did you get into the wildlife filmmaking industry? Well, when I started out, I was a a graduate with a biological background and in Bristol. And of course, that is where the BBC Natural History Unit is based. And so I thought, wow, this looks like a great career. I'd, I'd actually done an expedition while I was at university and we made a very bad film on that expedition um, um, but it made some contacts for me and in those days you could literally walk into buildings and go and have a cup of tea with people um, now it's all very uh, managed and you can't do that anymore and I started actually by getting interested in sound recording so I joined this association called the International Association of Wildlife Filmmakers as a young sound recordist and I started getting interest in possibly going on, on trips as an uh, assistant, doing some sound. Um, and as is a way with all this sort of filming, a lot of these things were potentially going to happen but never did. But it led to quite a few contacts with people. And one of the first people who actually offered me a job was a guy called Chris Parsons, who was one of the founding members of the Natural History Unit and also the executive producer of Life on Earth. And he had set up as an independent making IMAX films. So my first experience really was as a young researcher on an IMAX film for 18 months. And there was a wonderful project on plant-animal interactions. And from there, I I met other people and just eventually knocked on doors. And I got into the BBC through a guy called Nigel Marvin, who was a producer at the time and went on to become a presenter. Uh, and I literally turned up, had a chat with him, and he showed me a desk, and I started work. That's you couldn't right. do that now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Things have changed somewhat. Yeah, yeah. So it was a great start, and we I worked then with Nigel for five, six years on a whole variety of projects, from um, a project on magpies to um, working on one on called, which I really liked, was uh, The Witness Was a Fly, which is all about how animals can be used to... Um, in criminology and that was a really inventive program that was for BBC Natural World uh, at the time and then my first break as a director was with Nigel on a series called Incredible Journeys and I had responsibility for the migration of the monarch butterflies from Canada down to Mexico and that was really the first time I could direct and do the whole film myself which was a real great opportunity. That's fantastic. So with Nigel Marvin, was that, uh, were you directing him as a presenter or was that, that was later on in his career? At that time he was very much a producer and he is a very good producer, uh, in fact. And um, he was very open to giving people uh, opportunities to go out and test themselves. And in those days it was film. And I I remember him once saying, I don't know whether you know Nigel, but he's got a very distinctive voice and saying, there's no such word as over, overshooting in my vocabulary. You can do what you like. And my very <laughs> my very first shoot, we did um, Belter Kingfishers in, in um, I think it was in Massachusetts. And we came away with, I don't know how many cans, but it was a pile of cans. And Nigel took one look at them and he said, when I said there's no such word as overshoot, you bloody overshot. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Excellent. 
yeah, I mean that that's uh, that's refreshing to to find a producer say that because these days it's um, although it's easier now to overshoot with digital media, um, it's still just the the workflow, right? The process of going through it all and, yes. and building your story. Yeah, and you know it's we we shot a lot because we would in those days, of course, we were also doing a lot of high speed bird filming and we had low cams and you'd be racing film through those very primitive cameras at a quite a rate, you know, and. Um, and Nigel was a very keen birder, so he was always coming up with birding ideas that we would work on. Um, but after I worked with him, I I moved on. I had a break in New York and did some script writing courses and then came back to the BBC to carry on uh, producing on uh, a, a project. Uh, one of them was um, The Greatest Wildlife Show on Earth, which was a Millennium Day special uh, with, presented by David Attenborough. And so that was the first time I worked with him. And the idea behind that was it was looking at uh, great natural events around the world, each month being an, an event. And we took David to the Monarch Butterfly site because he'd never been there before. And then also took him to Yellowstone, to the Bison, where he'd been there before. But it was a very nice way to have him in the film. And so that was my first experience of working with him. Wonderful. And what year was that? Uh, that we, 99. 99 mm -hmm. yeah that's that's wonderful um I, I did a series wild events which was very very similar yeah. going to all of yeah. those and we had monarch butterflies that was one of the biggest you know one of my up there in the top yeah. kind of three to do but we we never got to do it which was a shame so it got it got pushed off the list but i love the way that you say that in your early career the first film you made was terrible <laughs> <laughs> i think that's great because that's probably the same with most people yes um it sounds like it, it wasn't just an easy stepping stone, though. You you went from um, you know starting off and then going to the BBC and then going and doing other stuff and mm. coming back. Mm -hmm. So, you, was it always kind of a struggle to get back in or to fit oh, back yes, into these yeah. places? And you know, we talk about recessions a lot um, in economies now. When I left university, we were in the middle of a recession. Um, so there wasn't that much work. So in between trying to work as a in TV, I was trying to do temporary work elsewhere, and all that dried up because of the recession. So it was, there was about two years where I thought, gosh, what am I going to do? And I almost gave up. I actually, um, had, well, I, I was going to move on and do a PhD, and I got accepted to do a PhD on uh, hurricane uh, damage to a Jamaican fang virus. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I, I started getting uh, other bits of work, and I thought, well, what am I going to do after I've done my PhD? I probably want to try and do the same thing again. So in the end, I actually continued to try and get TV work. And after a, a couple of years, I think it started rolling in and I started actually feeling that work was more regular. And once I'd actually started working with Nigel, although in those days the contracts were like a week at a time, they did, right. they did actually get renewed and eventually went on to become staff. But it took, it took a while. And, and do you think it's harder now, or do you think uh, things are things are easier to break into the industry, or harder in general? It's it, it's it's easier and harder in, in some ways. It's I think there's a lot more opportunity for young filmmakers to make their own films now. You know, with the digital revolution, it means that the people can go out and film on almost anything. And if you've got uh, good ideas and good talent, you can use anything to make a story. Really. You can shoot it on an iPhone, and I think that's that's a really good thing. I think it's harder in other respects because I think it's a lot more managed now. I think TV access to getting to meet people is a lot more managed. You know, there's talent managers who stop you from may maybe meeting producers. And now, uh, you know, now that as a small independent in running a small independent, I do try and meet people who young people who are coming through because I think it's very important that you have those meetings you just keep knocking people back because it is you know they are the lifeblood of the future for TV but I think it's it's harder for them to necessarily knock on doors these days they feel that you know it that basically there's always somebody blocking them from meeting the people they want to meet and I think that that brings up um, a good point about film festivals and and how networking is such a, a vital part of the industry. I, mean, yeah. I think it always has been, but certainly today, yeah. and getting to meet the right people. Absolutely, and there are a few people here who I know from Bristol who are quite new graduates who have obviously made that decision to come over here and and see if they can find any work, which is a great thing if you can do it, you know. And I think a lot of people, young people, volunteer for festivals as well, which is a wonderful thing as well. Now you, uh, I believe, were 15 years with the BBC, yeah. and then you chose to leave mm -hmm. and start up your own independent company. Yeah. What, what was the driving factor there to do that? 
I think, you know, when you're in an organization like the BBC for a long time, uh, you get a feeling that you might be pigeonholed. And I wanted to try different sorts of projects. And it, it was harder to sort of move on to those sorts of projects. So I wanted to pitch different ideas. And and I, I so originally I, I left the BBC and freelance for a while, moving around different independent companies. And it gave me a good idea of how the independence circuit works, really, and how difficult it is. You know, <laughs> it's uh, the the pitching and commissioning is very, very hard, you know. Uh, but then so what happened was I went back to the BBC as a freelancer on a couple of projects. And then I got my break as an indie doing a natural world. I'd made a natural world in-house. And then we had this idea. Um, I had a I, something pinged through on my email. It's a it's a kind of a notification of new scientific papers that are coming out before they're actually published. And it was about the discovery of venom in Komodo dragons. So I immediately contacted the scientists. There's this incredible character called uh, Brian Fry in, in Australia and said, I really would like to make this film. Can I come and see you? And I literally flew out to Australia for a day to see him for a day to see if he would sign up to do this film about this discovery. And And the BBC really liked the idea. So... I said I wanted to do it as an independent, and that was the first step um, to starting Humble Bee Films, really, with a, with a one hour for BBC Natural World and Animal Planet. Uh, and they were receptive to that? There wasn't any kind of pushback that they wanted to keep it in-house or anything like that? No, not, uh, BBC Natural World is a, a really good strand in that it's, it's la a large proportion come from independents. So I think that they are very receptive to people pitching as an indie, um, and I think Right from the start, I made clear that I would probably want to pitch this idea as an independent. Um, and also it meant there was one less person on their books as right. <laughs> in-house. Right. In <laughs> and then you went on to um, to work with David Attenborough uh, quite extensively on mm. Natural Curiosities, yeah. or David Attenborough's Natural Cur yeah. Curiosities, I think the full title. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Did you, having worked with him once um, with the, the series you were talking about, um, was it just a natural progression from there? or? Um yeah, so when I left the BBC, I, I, I did a few th more things with David. I, I did a, um, a film on global warming for uh, an organisation called UKTV, who are half owned by BBC Worldwide in, in the UK. And, uh, and we kept in contact, and I kept saying, I want to do some ideas with you. And um, I... I just came up with the idea one day, um, desperately thinking, "Why? Right, what could we do? And I know David has a real interest in the history of natural history. He's got an amazing library with books that go back to the sort of 16th century. And um, so I had this idea of these kind of curiosities that uh, early scientists or early researchers might have looked at and come up with ridiculous explanations for. And the, the main one that I knew he had a passion for was the platypus, which, of course, everybody thought was a hoax when it was first discovered. Right. And so we put together this idea of shorts that we took to UK TV to see if we could do them as shorts. And they fell in love with the idea and said, no, we don't want to do this as shorts. We like to do half hours. Uh, and that's kind of how it evolved. You know, so we paired up some of the creatures uh, that you would think would not be connected in some way. So the curious hoax, we, we had a platypus and then we had a, a, a midwife toad. There was an amazing hoax story about the way that was discovered. So we, we went back with five parts and we made the five parts with David, and it's very much in museums or in universities. And w once we started editing the series, they fell in love with it, and they commissioned the next series straight away, and they, they supersized it to a 10-part series. So it went from there, and we've made four series since then. That's fantastic. That's great when when networks come back and want more yeah, <laughs> with, yes. without you having to pitch your game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's always fantastic. Um, now, working with an icon like David Attenborough, um, how how was that the first time? I mean, here you are, you've broken into the industry, you've been working in the industry, but then you're you're working on top, top level natural history programs. You know, is that... Um, we, we, how did you feel about that? You know, when you first got going with it, it? it's nerve-wracking because you, his reputation uh, as being the best, really, what he does, and he is very um, insightful and he's very knowledgeable, and uh, but he's very warm and very welcoming as well. He's a very gracious person, so he puts you at ease. Um, but obviously, as a newbie, when I first worked with him, you want to make make sure you do a great job. Um, so we, but we had a great relationship from the start. So I think that's that's we, we've always got on very well, and I think he trusts me to make a, a decent film. 
Um, but there are moments where you realize he's got, he can look at you and you'll realize you're making a mistake or, you know, he's very, you know, um, he, he can basically, he, if you suddenly say, oh, we want to do this or we're thinking about this idea or this bit of science, he'll know about it and he'll know the ins and outs of it. So you have to be really well read up about it because he will have spoken to the person who's done that paper at a dinner the night before <laughs> so right. it, his brain is incredible you know so you have to be on top form and you feel like you're always having to perform well you're pulling your bootstraps up every time you you work with him because he is at that level i mean it's great to have someone on camera with that kind of knowledge because in some sense you're full you can fall back on that because yeah. he's got great knowledge at the same time as you say you got to know you got to know <laughs> yes. as much to, to stay on yes. to stay on the level um and going on from there, in terms of finding new stories these days, I mean, we, you know, so much has been filmed. The, the world has got smaller and smaller in terms of uh, what we've seen on TV and the, the places that uh, production crews have traveled to. I, is it now harder to find good stories or is it just a case of re thinking the stories that have already been told i think there are always new stories out there and, and there may be new discoveries or new new aspects of behavior and i think they're, they're there they're not easy to come by necessarily but i do think there's a lot of the time we probably look at things in new ways which is always great so you will find that maybe a series that's been done 10 15 years ago perhaps the technology allows you to look at a different way at this and so I think that I, I don't think there's any lack of ideas I think sometimes there might be a lack of imagination sometimes with the commissioning process that people want to do the same thing over and over again if it's successful but I, I certainly think the natural world has always got new stories or new ways of telling those stories. Now there's a big um a big difference with the kind of uh, the mix of programming in the natural history world. Uh, we go from the kind of blue chip David Attenborough style wildlife shows right down to um, uh, things like the Steve Irwin style shows, um, uh, the, the re more reality based stuff. What do you think is going to be the future of natural history? Do you think the reality style can last or do you think that's kind of a fad that's going to peter out? Will it will blue chip kind of remain there and these other things come and go or do you think that's here to last? Uh, I, I think it's really interesting because flipping the way around, I remember many years ago uh, when I was at the BBC that people were predicting the end of blue chip, yeah, that it wasn't going to last and, and then Blue Planet hit and it was a phenomenal success and then planet earth soon after and a global success and it's funny how people then were very down about blue chip and i think it's the fortunes of blue chip turned around and i think we now recognize that in a global market blue chip works really well because it translates easily across different languages and different cultures so but in terms of the reality show i think I'm not sure. I think there will always be a reinvention of the way in which we do wildlife and there'll always be that kind of adventure. But I do think people sometimes see through some of the set up stuff that's happening and I wonder whether we have hit a peak with some of that. And you know, we you know, we know the discovery have had a sort of slight change of tack in terms of trying to pull back on some of those kinds of programmes and maybe go back for more classic or um what they call a halo, <laughs> you know, uh, program making. And I think that's quite important, but I don't think that's going to preclude looking for new ways and doing adventure or, or putting people in the wild or doing slightly different things, which we would probably term reality. I think the tr problem with reality is that when it's successful, it often becomes more and more unreal because it becomes more and more staged. And I think people start seeing through that. So I, I think I'm sure there'll be many more reinventions of that, but I think blue chip is probably going to be uh, on, on different scales. I mean, I think from the most expensive down to ways in which you can deliver a really interesting blue chip TV program that isn't very expensive but still very compelling. I think that's a, a very strong genre that will still persist. And of course, those big blue chip shows like Planet Earth and um, um, Blue Planet have that kind of um, draw that they have big DVD sales, Blu-ray sales after the event. And, you know, they're fantastic to sit at home and, uh, and watch. Um, uh, and so I think that the f that format is probably here to stay because mm. of that, you mm. know, um, they're the kind of thing you like to have. It's a bit like a National Geographic magazine. Yes. You know, you own them for years and years to come and pass them on. Yeah. 
In terms of these new formats and distribution channels, uh, how do you see the future of, of TV, broadcast TV as opposed to online? We've got online uh, uh, where we can have video on demand, we can pay for it whenever we want, we can subscribe to Netflix or Amazon or any of the other video on demand sites. And then of course you've got broadcast TV. It seems like a lot of people are moving from broadcast TV to the online formats. Uh, how do, do you have any kind of insight to where you think that's gonna go? Oh, gosh, I, I wish I gave a crystal ball for that. But it's it's a very interesting one because one of the big debates we always have is about bringing young audiences to to what we do. And and a lot of broadcasters, I mean, I can speak only really from the UK perspective, but certainly the mainstream channels, uh, even channels like Channel 4, which tend to in the past have a youth-oriented um, audience. I mean, their average audience is way over 40 in their 50s. BBC 60 plus, uh, Channel 5 60 plus. I mean, it is a remarkably an older audience that is attracted to those mainstream channels. And yet, I think that family viewing, when you get the right sort of programming, you can bring in a huge young audience through family viewing. And in fact, funnily enough, with Natural Curiosities, even though it's on a, a smaller cable channel in the UK, uh, it it has a high peak in 16 to 30 year olds because I think it had a different style. It's it's what we call sort of very, you know, uh, small bites because the stories of each half were 11 minutes long. There's a lot in there. And, and so you go away with all these facts and all this interesting stuff and it seemed to really appeal to a young audience. Um, and I think that's the challenge that we have. And I think that's where this whole new uh, uh, streaming platforms or the online platforms, they, they appeal to a younger audience because you can just uh, access stuff quickly in short bites. So I think that's going to probably expand quite remarkably. I think there's going to be an interesting model to be had there. You know, how do you how do you make content for that? If if you know, how do you make it work in terms of monetizing it? Is it is a difficult thing? Is it going to just purely purely through advertising? You know, if you're providing two minute, three minute. Uh, pieces to go up on Facebook or whatever, who's paying for that? So it's a very, very interesting area. But I think the main broadcasters will persist. Their audiences might go down, but I still think there's always going to be, if they're probably going to also branch out into some of those other avenues so they can they can move their content through different media. And I think that's what they're already doing, you know. And I think so they'll, they'll make moves to actually, rather than relying on, let's say Netflix or Amazon, to say take our, our, our programs, they'll probably try and own it more themselves, I imagine. Now, one of the um, uh, talks today was on how social media needs to be incorporated in pitches and with really everything that's going on today with TV, that there has to be some kind of social media element to new programming. Are you finding that with the programming that you're doing now? Are you incorporating that way ahead of a release of a program? It depends on the program. Sometimes you can see that there's an element there you think, wow, this could really work for social media. But not always. I think sometimes you think of the program first and then you work backwards and think, right, how can we expand this out? Um, so we're doing a film with David Attenborough about the life of Jumbo the Elephant at the moment. And we're talking about can we make a bigger online or social media presence about uh, elephants in captivity or the debate around elephants in captivity because Jumbo was one of the early elephants in captivity. And so now we're, we're kind of exploring that and there's interest in that. Sometimes you go with an idea and, you're th and you're, you immediately can see the potential of reaching out through social media with, with, with something or engaging younger audiences. So I, I think it just depends on the project. And, and when you're talking about putting things out on social media, would you actually take clips from the program that you're producing and put them on ahead of time or would you be creating content in its own right for that a combination of both often you you might take some really lovely moments from the film um, but sometimes you'll have other content that you think actually we can repackage that in a way so and so i think it's a, it, it depends the the clips you take from the film are often just to get you notice to begin with get people talking but then you want to provide something else beyond that you know to say actually there's more to this story than than the one hour or the series that you're watching so i i, I think it's a combination of the two now in terms of uh the experiences you've had filming experiences you're well traveled you've mm -hmm. done a lot of programming what are some of the issues you've encountered some of the bigger issues out in the field film filmmaking 
logistical or, or really anything you know I, <laughs> I, I hear some incredible stories from people of uh, you know being out in the field and you know in remote areas and cameras stop working you know <laughs> or, or um, you know and having to overcome those challenges when you're in the field I think I think now we're in a place where the electronics have got a lot more um, mm. uh, robust yeah. um, and there's less moving parts. But most people I speak to have had kind of challenges they've over, had to overcome. It may be, you know, something that's been forgotten <laughs> or, you know, suddenly you're in the field and, and something <laughs> horrendous happens. I, I remember, I mean, you know, we you always have challenges, when, particularly when you're working on film, that uh, things can go wrong and, you know, cameras packing up. And But the thing about film was that the cameras that were in a way often mechanical and could be fixed quite easily and uh but i remember when we were filming model butterflies the first time i filmed them for incredible journeys uh in those days there weren't drones to film and it was before cineflexes and we had this guy who still does a lot of stuff with john down at the moment and uh, jeff bell and he he used to do a lot of our aerials with model helicopters that he would actually put a bolex camera in and he would fly them so you could fly them for 10 minutes and do your aerials that way so he was a, a, a basically a model enthusiast who turned into filmmaking right and he came out to film mono butterflies with nigel marvin i was out doing the most of the filming nigel came out with him to mexico uh to do these aerials with this uh camera and he was booked to come for something like 10 days or two weeks so it's quite a long shoot for him and so it's quite a high cup into the 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 um the the site where the monarchs are based and it's at altitude so you you get, get out of breath so jeff was kind of you know sort of came up and he was i suppose in his 50s then at the time and uh got the whole thing set up you know he put the blades on get it set up got this got the helicopter up in the air got the remote control going flew it down the valley towards the monarchs and then suddenly, <laughs> of course, it just sucked in all these flying butterflies. Oh. And the thing just crashed <sighs> down on the ground. And that was it. Oh, no. That was the aerial shooting over. Right. <laughs> and we got one shot. And I remember Jeff stayed with us for the rest of the trip, as you would, because he was right. booked. Um, and had a great time having lots of food and coming out and sort of helping with us on location. But he, it was a good shot that we got. <laughs> but the <laughs> idea, goodness. we were doing loads and loads of different sorts of filming. But we suddenly thought nobody had thought this through, really, about flying a helicopter with blades through millions of air butterflies in the air. <laughs> right, right. Gosh, so but you were able to salvage the film. That, yeah. that was film or that was... It was film. film. So the, the film, film was fine. Wow. Uh, the helicopter was... a was a bit knackered but he yeah. i mean he had he could repair it back at home yeah but, yeah. but it's not like being able to carry a second drone these no, days right no <laughs> oh that's incredible and, and on the in the same vein what's the most incredible experience you've had oh gosh i would think grizzly bears in alaska um i filmed a mcneil river uh, sanctuary which is one of the biggest gathering of grizzly bears in the world and in fact i've just bumped into shane moore who i haven't seen for almost 20 years who was the cameraman who worked with me on that and we were this was part of our greatest wildlife show on earth and we were doing the spectacle of grizzly bears uh gathering around you know the salmon run i think there were 60 or 70 bears in this oh one wow. spot and we camped on site and you know you'd wake up in the morning and you could hear the bears had been you could, well you could sense they'd been sleeping around you and uh and then we'd hike to the location to film them during the day and you'd literally have these bears fighting in front of you over salmon then they'd come past you walk past you and eat the salmon literally sitting right next to you within touching distance and seeing all those bears gathered in one place and being so close to them and not feeling unsafe i mean we had a ranger with a gun but they said they never had to use it you know and it was an extraordinary experience and a real a real honor because you, you know, it was pure luck that we managed to get into that location in time for our filming. Always nice when there are salmon around when you're around a lot of bears. <laughs> yes, yeah. They are distracted. Fed, yes. That's right. A fed bear is far better than a hungry bear. So <laughs> yeah. that's always good. Yeah. Um, if you had to give one piece of advice to someone trying to get into the industry. Now, you're, you're a creative director. You're an independent. Um, but you direct, you produce. So uh, in terms of people who are trying to get into directing and producing and just independent filmmaking in general, what would be the key kind of takeaway piece of advice that you would, uh, you would give to them? I think some, for somebody who's new, it's being persistent 
uh, but not to the point of stalking. <laughs> um, I think you, you sound know, like you're speaking from experience. Yeah, I, I think you do. <laughs> I think you, you know, even now as a sort of experienced filmmaker, we feel we have to contact people with ideas, and you have to chase people a lot. And we get at the other end, you know, new people coming and chasing me for, can we come and see you? And I think there's no harm in that, as long as it's not every two hours you're sending emails or trying to ring people up. But I, I, I would say don't give up if you're really determined. It's very easy to become disheartened. But I'd also say study the channels and the broadcasters and what they do because often people will come with an idea that isn't suited to a certain channel and I think it's good to have a, a knowledge of, you know, oh, this could be suitable for, for BBC or this might be suitable for Na National Geographic or, you know, and, and think about where you're, where you're going to take your idea because there's no point in coming with an idea. Also, we get a lot of people coming to us with ideas and saying, we think this could work really well and you s we say, well, that went out about two weeks ago on TV. Did you not see it? So be aware of what's going on, you know, really study what's happening. Yeah, that's that's great advice. I think there's so much of the time people spend so much time pondering ideas that if they're not careful, people snap them up. I mean, as we were saying yeah. earlier, it's a small world. Yeah. So there's people everywhere with cameras these days. Now, wh where, where are you off to next? What, what's your, your next? You're working uh, with David Attenborough at the moment on a new series. Yes, we're just uh, doing a, f a program, well, a program called Jumbo, The Life of Jumbo the Elephant who was on the first African elephants in the UK and then in America. He went over to America and became this huge superstar. But we're in the post-production phase of that now. We're doing the post in, in Toronto because it's a co-production with CBC. It's a BBC and CBC co-production. So I go back to England, then go to Toronto for post. And then I'm going to the Bahamas filming Swimming Pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, right? Yeah. They're, they're quite popular now out there, yes, I think, aren't yes. they? Quite so a tourist attraction. Well, they are, and, and we are doing a whole program about the success of pigs around the world. They're the second most distributed mammal after humans. And what I love about the swimming pigs of the Bahamas is that, I mean, it's the ultimate in evolution, isn't it? You become domesticated. Um, and in theory, you're going to go and be butchered and taken off and killed but no you get put on an island <laughs> and then you get all these tourists come and feed you and you have a great life you know that's right, i mean paradise. that's just the pinnacle isn't it of evolution you know i get fed i have a lovely island to live on what's to worry about that's fantastic be a yeah, pig paradise <laughs> In terms of funding, you, you were talking about co-productions there. Um, a lot of people ask me about the different styles of acquisitions and, and um, you know, how, how films are paid for. Can you explain a little bit about some of the ways that you fund your films, whether it's co-productions or acquisitions or, you know, the, the, the different types of funding that there is? In the ideal world, you probably want to get uh, uh, co-producers working together. You might want to get a, a British and an American co-producer or a European partner um, because co-productions usually tend to mean more money. Um, you know, if you've got, say, somebody in England putting money in and somebody in America uh, and it's considered a co-production, then you expect them to have equal editorial control in a sense and they'll put more money in. Um, sometimes you get co-productions and sometimes you get pre-sales or acquisitions uh pre-sales probably still some editorial control someone you might say oh, we'll want to buy that in advance for our territory um so we'll put money down now and that can be very useful top up money um you might also get funding from a distributor who might say actually we'll take that idea of film from you once it's made and we'll sell it around the world and you can often try and push them to put funding in up front so it depends on the markets and sometimes it's hard to necessarily get co-production with certain territories because you have to then pair up with a, another company in that in that territory so it, it makes it more complicated so sometimes it's easier just to do a pre-sale on acquisition in the case of jumbo it's a full co-production with another production company in in canada so some of the money, all of the money, has to be spent in Canada, but that's fine um, because we were filming there anyway and we can do some of the posts there. Um, so it's worked out really well. So, so the models vary from territory to territory, really. And I think you often end up with maybe three or four uh, territories putting money in just to get a film made. You know, if you had to, if you had to um, advise someone, they've, they've say they have a story. I, I, actually, someone asked me this this morning, and I hear this quite a lot. They have a story they're very passionate about, and they've, they've been producing it for a while. Um, and then they, they start pitching it to various networks, and the networks want to take over, as you were saying, editorial control. But they're so passionate about it, they, they can't bear to see it being changed. And so they look for funding elsewhere. 
what would your advice be? Because I, I think um, so much of the time, passion can override the kind of, you know, the the senses on whether you should, you know, get something on TV, yeah. release some editorial control because the people know what they're talking about in, yeah. in the industry. Um, what, what would your advice be in, in that circumstance? I think, you know, sometimes you have to realize that if somebody's paying you a lot of money, um, you know, if you're talking several hundred thousand uh, dollars or um, even more, then really they're going to want to make sure that they get the bespoke product for them. And so you can be passionate about it. And I think it's about building the right relationship. So you might, if you're really passionate about the idea and you want to make it the way you want to make it, you've got to try and find the right partner. Um, and you don't always end up making the completely the film that you want to make because there will be compromises because they might have a slightly different view at the end of production about how it should be tailored and the edit. Um, but you've got to remember they are funding it. I think if, you're re if it's a real, real passion project and you don't want to you know to to change it too much then i think you you can go away and find try and find new partners or find a different way of funding it but that takes a lot longer and there's the risk that it might get made by somebody else or you might never make it i think the there's a great story about the director of la la land who apparently got offered i think a million dollars to make la la land quite a few years ago and they wanted to change the uh main character who is of course a jazz musician in, in into a rock and roll uh, character and have a different ending and he, he turned down the money he said no I'm not going to do that and then he went off and made Whiplash and then he um, garnered some awards including an Oscar nomination for that and so he was then offered much more money 30 million to make the film that he wanted to make so he stuck to his guns there and got more money paid to off. make a film and it paid off I'd say those examples are pretty rare right? Um, and I admire him for that but I think what we have to remember is that you know, it's you can go for many, many years and not make that project. But sometimes you can tuck it in your back pocket and say, okay, it's not quite right now. I will repitch it to somewhere else years later. There are many projects that we, we two or three years later, will repitch and we'll get funded. And because we haven't felt that we weren't getting enough interest or it wasn't quite right at the time. But I think there are a lot of here. What's wonderful about here is you get people who are making volume, but then you get people who are making passion projects that maybe one hour long. And I admire those people making those kind of projects because it's much harder to do. But if they can do it, it's great. It's fantastic. Well, and th there are other ways of raising funds these days. That it's a lot easier than it used to be now with crowdfunding. And um, there are ways to do it. And yeah. I think um, if it's a passion project that you... Your, it, it's it's your life's work then fair enough and it, it can end up as you say like the director who who you know got much more money out of it and got his project made the way he wants to make it but um but at the same time you could just sit there for the rest of your life hoping that someone's going to take yes. it on and it never gets made so yeah there we and go. you want an audience as well so you know there's one thing making it it's the other thing is getting it out there to a big audience and if you're making a passion project which often might have be you're doing it because you really believe in in it it might be a conservation project then you want a big audience to see it so you need the right partnerships for that as well and now you you have a team of seven people at humble uh b film mm -hmm. films um are you as a creative director are you the one kind of looking out for the stories to develop to then move on through the team or are all of you kind of looking for stories all the time that you pitch to each other and we try and encourage people we we have brainstorming sessions where we encourage the team to to pitch ideas um it's a mixture of the two sometimes from feedback from meeting channels and broadcasters i will have a steer so i would say right we need to think about this but we encourage people to come up with ideas you know that we think you know are great you know if it works we'll we'll dig into it and see if you know sometimes it might just be a title or it might just be a thought but we might dig into it for a while to see if we can work into something so we try and be democratic about it and see if we can because it's a good way of bringing ideas through i think Excellent. Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day today. It's always nice also when people have worked for like the BBC and then gone independent to, you know, to show that, you know, those things, uh, uh, you, know, you can do that, right? Yeah. There's so many people think their end game is to work for <laughs> yes. the BBC. Oh, no. and, then, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, here you are showing that that's not always the case. So yeah, that's fantastic. Welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. 
If, if you've, you've enjoyed, enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife, Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, Podcast then, then please leave a rating and a comment. comment. And remember, and remember to subscribe to keep up to date with, with the series' future episodes. You can find out more information about wildlife filming at jakewillers.com. And if you're interested and if you're in starting a career in the wildlife filmmaking, in the wildlife filmmaking industry, wildlife filmmaking or being mentored to or being further your career, career then your please career, visit then please jakewillers.com forward slash mentorship. Thanks for listening.